Welcome to 2819. I'm Sandra Dimez. And I'm Brian Rollenbacher. In Culture <laughs> Talk, Sandra's going to be interviewing Sean McDowell about the Christian ethics of Spider-Man. And in Give and Take, Jeff will be talking with astronomer Hugh Ross about whether our sun is special or if it's just like every other star out there. I think you're special, Mr. Sun. Aww. First up, though, is RTB 101. Crystal will be talking with philosopher and theologian Ken Samples as they discuss the differences between Islam and Christianity. Let's check it out. Now it's time for RTB 101. This is where we discuss practical questions to help equip you to share your faith more effectively. And once again, here to help me talk about a very important topic is Kenneth Samples. Welcome, Ken. Hi. How are you doing? It's good to have you here today to talk about issues related to Islam. And we're going to really be focusing on differences between Islam and Christianity. And I'm so glad you're here to help me talk about this because Islam is a key competitor to Christianity. Maybe you can help kind of paint that picture a little for us, Ken. Yeah, the Pew Research um, put out a statement a couple of years ago, and they said that if current trends continue, there will be nine, in 2050, there'll be 9 billion people living on planet Earth, approximately 3 billion Christians, approximately 3 billion Muslims, and then 3 billion others that would be made up of both religious and secular. And if you add up all the Christians in the world, that is, if you're very inclusive, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, etc. You have about 2.2 billion. Muslims make up about 1.9 billion. So world population for Christians and Muslims is a, an amazing 55% of the world's total population. That's so interesting. So as the population is going to grow, um, we're going to see some parity between Islam and Christianity. Um, I know that there are key differences between our faith and that of our Muslim neighbors. Um, I know that whenever I talk about religions, often I like to start with the Trinity because that is really a key difference between us and other religions. And I'm wondering if that's true between us and Islam as well. Yes, you're right on target. Uh, the Trinity is a major difference. Um, instead of believing, as Trinitarians do, that there is one God in three persons, Muslims embrace a Unitarian view that says there's one God, one person. And in fact, there is a condemnation of the Trinity found in the Quran where they misidentify the Trinity. They say it is the Father, the Son, and the Virgin Mary. But uh, Islam is clearly Unitarian, having more in common, let's say, with traditional Judaism or maybe with uh, Zoroastrianism. But the Trinity is rejected by traditional Islam. So when we talk to Muslims, we're going to have to know right out of the gate that our concept of God is, is somewhat different than yes. theirs. And, and we're going to have to be careful to define our terms I'm wondering if that's also true when we turn to conversations about Jesus, because I know that my Muslim friends, they honor Jesus. They seem to have some respect for Jesus. Um, but how do they see Jesus as being different than I would as a Christian? Yeah, you're right. Uh, they do say they do honor him. They say that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a holy life uh, and performed the, the miraculous in his public ministry, though they say he's not as high as Muhammad. And where they fundamentally differ with historic Christianity is they say that Jesus is merely or solely a human being. So Islam categorically rejects the deity of Christ. They would see him merely as human, and therefore it is idolatry for Christians to worship Jesus as as if he were God. This is what Muslims call shirk, which is one of the, the worst theological uh, practices you could engage in. So worshiping Jesus, and, and when I talk about that as a Christian, that's going to be a bit of a hindrance yes. for my Muslim friends, you know, that we're going to have to work through. And I'm imagining 
you know, conversations about him being the son of God and and some some complications related to that. That's going to be somewhat offensive to them as well. Is that true? Yes. And I think that uh, when Muhammad, uh, it, during his lifetime, he encountered uh, Jews and Christians. But I think that the Christians he encountered were heretical, unorthodox. I don't think Muhammad ever had a clear understanding of either the Trinity or the two natures of Christ. So this, this is a major area of difference between the two faiths. Interesting. So what about the death of Jesus? I've run into that too with Muslims, um, where they seem to uh, not completely understand the historic Christian position about Jesus's death. Can you give me any insight into that? Yeah, they think that God, Allah, in their mind, would never allow the great prophet Jesus to die in such a uh, despicable manner. And so within Islam, there is the belief that either he didn't die on the cross, uh, or even though he may have been impaled, or that somebody else, maybe Barabbas or some other figure, took his place. But regardless, uh, Islam is not a redemptive religion. That is, Muhammad or any no other person does something that changes your destiny before God. So the crucifixion and the atonement would be another area of uh, you know strenuous disagreement. That's really helpful because what I'm seeing unfold here is that although we have in common that yes, we both believe in God and we believe there is one God, there are some significant differences in how we define who God is, who Jesus is, what happened at the crucifixion. Another critical question that that Christianity answers is the question of what is humanity's fundamental problem? Uh, We call this sin. What, what, What might my Muslim friends say to that question? Yeah, interestingly enough, um, Muslims don't believe that humans are made in the image of God, but nor do they believe in original sin. They believe human beings, babies are born good. Now, this is a puzzling type of thing because Islam has had uh, such a challenge when it comes to, uh, you know, violence and things of that nature. But they, they don't accept the fall. They do not believe that human beings uh, have a sinful nature and a propensity towards sin. So their view of humanity is that, that humans uh, have no such fallen nature. What's interesting to me, Ken, is as this picture is emerging, it, it almost goes against what our culture is saying. Our culture says that basically all religions are the same. But the way that you're describing the differences in some very critical areas between historic Christianity and the faith of Islam, these are not just differences that we can just kind of paper over <laughs> in a superficial kind of a way. I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I completely agree. I mean, Islam comes about 600 years after the the birth, life, and death of Christ. And the differences that emerge, I mean, there are similarities, both theistic, both monotheistic, both Middle Eastern, both claim to be uh, connected to Abraham in the Hebrew Old Testament. But essentially what we discover is that Islam denies the very essence of historic Christianity. Christian view of God, the Christian view of Christ, uh, the Christian view of atonement, the Christian view of humanity. These are not uh, insignificant differences, which then leads to the conclusion that if Islam is true, Christianity is false, and vice versa. If Christianity is true, Islam would be false. That doesn't set well with our kind of pluralistic culture. Yeah, I think that's that's really helpful because they almost, you know, we, we can't live in a world where they're both true. One of them must be false or they most both must be false. Um, I'm wondering from a third perspective of the non-Christian, he might say, well, this is just this just goes to show the religion is just stupid. I mean, look at all of these differences um, between these two religions. It, maybe you can help us. Um, think about how we might answer that that question when we talk to the non-Christian. Well, I, I think maybe one way of approaching it is to understand that 
that Christianity would not assert that everything in other, every other religion is false. I mean, after all, Christians believe hum, all people are made in the image of God. Christians believe everybody is the recipient of common grace and general revelation. So they're inevitably going to get certain things right. But given the fallenness of humanity and given the spiritual warfare in existence in the world, I think we should expect that non-Christian religions will be a mixture of truth and error. So false gods, false Christs, false gospels. Now, that, of course, I think needs some unpackaging for a non-Christian, but uh, it, it, it does indicate that everybody is going to get certain truths right because of the revelation that they're given. Very good. That's helpful. Thank you so much, Ken, for walking us through some of these critical differences between Islam and Christianity. And I do want to invite everyone to go check out Ken's blog. Just go to reasons.org and search for Reflections. Now it's time for Culture Talk, where we discuss culturally relevant topics that you can use to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with author and speaker Sean McDowell, and we are going to be talking about his favorite comic book character and how he ties it, that into Christian ethics. Welcome, Sean. Thank you for joining us. Sandra, thanks for having me. This is a treat. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I love your blog. I love that you kind of integrate pop culture and culturally relevant topics into the conversation about our Christian faith. And you had a post recently about why Spider-Man is your favorite superhero um, and you connect it to Christian ethics. Um, of course, you and I are both comic book fans and we love the movies and stuff. So I'd love to hear um, kind of your take on why Spider-Man represents Christian ethics. Yeah. So when I get when I get asked questions, I'm always thinking, is this worth writing a blog about? And for years, people keep asking me, why do you like Spider-Man so much? Who's your favorite superhero? Now, some of that is because I wear superhero shirts and I use superhero illustrations. And I've kind of got this athlete side to me, played college hoops. And I've got this love of like superhero side to me as well. So people would ask me, I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a blog. So when somebody asks me, I can just send them the response. And for me, I can't speak for anybody else, but ever since I was a kid, I mean, I have pictures of me opening up Spider-Man stuff when I was like three, four years old and just loving it. And I think there's two big reasons why is number one, Spider-Man's a relatable character, at least to me. I mean, I don't relate to Batman, this angst at losing his parents and being this brilliant, you know, rich guy I don't relate to Iron Man, the way he has his angst and he's a scientist in, in the world and kind of an entrepreneur. I don't relate to Hulk. I mean, I have my moments where I get frustrated. My kids will tell you, Dad, calm down. You're okay. <laughs> but this inner Hulk never connected with me. But Spider-Man's got like, you know, he's a normal teenage kid. He gets his superpowers, but he can't deliver the pizza. You know, he can fight the Sinister Six, but he, you know, can't get the girl. There's always a sense of like, Spider-Man's the person next door, um, plus he's sarcastic and I'm convinced that sarcasm is the sixth love language. So I just always related to Spider-Man. And the second reason, I don't, I didn't think about this when I was a kid, just as I got older, somebody's, somebody asked me, what is it about the ethic of Spider-Man that you love? And for some reason it just hit me that obviously what Ben Parker said to Peter Parker, he said, with great power comes great responsibility. I, I thought about that. I was like, gosh, that's kind of a Christian ethic mm -hmm. that God has given us spiritual gifts. He's given us, you know, bodies and life and all these amazing abilities, but there's a responsibility that comes along with that. In fact, Jesus said he's given much, much is required. So I don't want to overread things into Spider-Man because I haven't read all the different comic book universes, but I think that defining ethic it is very much a Christian ethic at well. At least we share that in common. Yeah, no, definitely. And that, and that was actually going to be kind of another point about that proverb, if you will, that with great mm. uh, power comes great responsibility. What are some of the other ethics that you see represented, not only in Spider-Man, but in some of these other characters? Because you've written about how Stan Lee really did incorporate some really good ethics in his characters. So what other examples are we seeing of Christian ethics in, in some of these characters? Yeah, and it's not just that all the characters have Christian ethics. I think it's pretty obvious that they don't. 
I mean that point more from a storytelling perspective. Stanley absolutely brilliantly would have characters with a backstory that motivates their life ethic, and they live consistently with that ethic for the most part. You know, so you know, you take Wolverine. He's Wolverine. He's an animal, and he kind of has this animalistic self-defense kind of ruthless character about him, but he's also deeply loyal in a sense. And you see that play through his character. Of course, Captain America. I mean, he's really just kind of defending America. He's this classical Boy Scout. You know, there's that line in the movies about, you know, about related to God that he gives. It's famous. Like you could argue that Captain America really has kind of a more conservative Christian ethic as well. So he plays that up consistently with Captain America. But you also see people like Iron Man, who's a little bit of a, a tortured billionaire because of his mistakes, wants to do the right thing, but just struggles because of decisions and failures in his past. And you just look at different characters, even Black Widow. You know, when you look at the history of where she came out of and she becomes kind of this assassin, you understand with her background why she acts the way she does. And at least in the movie universe, why she's yearning for this relationship and this family and the Avengers mean so much to her because she's never had that. So in some ways, I just think Stan Lee is a brilliant storyteller way ahead of his time. Nobody was casting these characters like he was. DC cast characters very differently. Right. No, indeed. And you know, you're talking about casting, you're talking about the movie universe. Um, so when we think about this topic, um, what would be kind of an organic way to bring up these movies that everybody's watching, I mean, they're like some of the top grossing films of all time. So people are well aware of them. How would you organically bring up the conversation uh, just about your faith in, in regards to these films? You know, in some of the Avengers movies, like I've asked people, like I think the Infinity War and uh, Infinity War and Endgame kind of had the gospel embedded within it a little bit. I did a whole blog series on Infinity War and the gospel and how when you watch Infinity War, it's about what's the value of a human life? What do we sacrifice somebody for? And this 10-year series climax is an Iron Man sacrificing his life. I mean, he's a Christ-type figure, powerfully so. So it's easy to just ask people, say, hey, what would you think about the ending of Endgame? Did you find it satisfying? Did you think somebody else should die? You think there should be another way? Do you think there's any religious ideas in the film? I mean, it, it's, it's honestly, it doesn't have to be that hard. The key is that you have a relationship, that we're not forcing it on people. I think people know when you're trying to like set them up for something and yeah. that there's just a relationship there that people will listen and it's the right setting. Like Thanksgiving right. dinner is probably not the right setting. So I think movies offer a powerful opportunity just to talk about justice talk about social issues, talk about science and faith, and talk about larger issues of faith in the gospel. And sometimes it's a symbol saying, hey, did you see that movie? What did you think about it? Did you enjoy it? What do you think the point was of the movie? Do you agree with that point? And you just start by listening. And oftentimes the conversation is off and running. I think that's such a great point, Sean. Um, definitely just listening to people and being willing to ask questions and hear what they have to say. Um, so where can people go to find your blog? Probably the best way would just be to go to seanmcdowell.org. Or if they want to know my superhero stuff, just type in my name in Spider-Man. It'll probably come up the blog or my name in Infinity War. I write now and then. I did one on Black Panther. When I see ideas intersect with a Christian worldview, I like to write blogs on it. So if they follow at seanmcdowell.org, they might see these popping up now and then. Wonderful. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next time. Hello, Jeff Zwerink here. Welcome to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help you be more confident in the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined by founder and president of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to talk about whether the sun is special or not. Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Well, thank you. So, Hugh, uh, you know, there's lots of stars out in the universe. We've got one at the center of our solar system. Um, you know, when you look at the number of stars out there, are there is our star unique when you look at its mass, its age, its luminosity, those sorts of things? Well, I mean, you've got stars of all different masses and ages, and you have to find a star that is exactly the mass of our star, the sun, exactly the same age, exactly the same composition, 
this is where it shows up unique, but that's not surprising because looking at a very wide range of possible values. So, so it sounds like, you know, the sun kind of sits in the, or within the distribution of what you would expect out there. And I, obviously the more you push on the precision or the accuracy, you're going to find it more and more unique. But um, so you make an argument that our sun is unique. And I think that has to do with uh, the variability. So kind of talk about some of the ways that stars are variable and why that's, uh, we'll, get, we're gonna, we'll explore why that's important for life here on Earth. Well, the age of a star and the mass of a star are very important to determine how much flaring activity you get and how the stable the luminosity of the star is. You know, in our star, the sun happens to be almost exactly halfway through its nuclear burning, and that's when it's most stable. It's also got the best possible mass for stability. Uh, but I think what's exciting is astronomers have been using the Kepler and the Gaia spacecraft to collect data from stars that are very close to having the sun's characteristics, especially its age and mass, and then in detail comparing the variability and the flaring activity with respect to the sun. So, so with that variability, we've got two different kinds of variability, presumably. One is where the actual brightness of the star goes up and down over some period of time. And then also where, uh, you know, we, sun has flares where it gives off brief bursts of things that make it brighter. So kind of uh, what, what is the data that Kepler is bringing in? What does it have to say about the flaring activity? Kind of let's, let's, let's dig into that. What sorts of flares do we see around our, from our star and what do we see from the Kepler data? Well, what we're noticing is that our star does have flares like all stars do, but our flares are tiny and infrequent. Whereas what we're seeing with the most sun-like stars being observed by Kepler and Gaia is they are, have many more flares going on, and the flares are much more uh, active than what we see in our sun. So let's, let's go on to the sun. What's, what's one of the larger flares that we've seen? What did it do? Kind of tell us about that. I think I know one of them is called the Carrington event. Let's talk about that one. Specifically. That happened in 1859. Uh, it's the biggest solar flare that's happened in the era where we had instruments to actually record what was going on. And uh, it was sufficiently... Uh, active that had knocked out telegraph systems around the world. I mean, we had telegraph operators getting electric shocks as a result of this uh, flare. Uh, today, it'd be much more destructive because we now have instrumentation that really do depend on our electromagnetic activities being much more stable. Yeah, I mean, I even recall reading that, uh, you know, they were sending telegraphs across the, the Atlantic Ocean. And so that's a fair amount of power you have to push through to drive a signal that far, that they actually disconnected the telegraph from the batteries and there was enough power coming into the system from the flare itself to drive the telegraph. So that's a pretty remarkable amount of power coming in from a flare, yet you're saying this is small compared to what we see out there. Yeah, this study basically what would be called super flares. Super flares are flares from stars that are intense enough that they happen in our sun. It would literally be the end of human civilization. And so we get small flares. Uh, Sun-like stars get really big flares. And they don't get them just like once every 20,000 years. They're getting them on an order of once a century or two. So, so kind of, if you could, just put that into context with this Carrington event. We saw that roughly 100 years ago. How much brighter are they than the Carrington event, and how much more frequently do they happen than something like that? Well, we're talking about a factor of 100 times more intense than the Carrington event. Uh, that's enough where it's going to not only uh, damage our technology and civilization, it's going to impact your crop productivity. So you're not going to have the food that you normally eat, and it will impact our health as well. So, so let's explore that a little bit, kind of for the last couple of minutes here. Um, you know, it seems to me, I mean, obviously we had the Carrington event, and had we not had telegraphs, we probably wouldn't even known about it. So right. when you're talking about these solar flares, are they damaging to life here on Earth, or are they damaging to our civilization that we have, or both? Well... As long as we get nothing uh, more substantial than the Carrington event, uh, yeah, it may impact our civilization or technology. It'll have no impact on our health. Uh, it'll have no impact on our crop productivity. But boost that up by a factor of 10 or 100 times, and it definitely would. And here on Earth, that 
only happens about once every 30,000 years. Uh, whereas with the most sun-like stars we're observing, we're seeing events like that happening about once a century, in some cases, once every few years. You know, so, I mean, obviously, if the Carrington event happened today, it would impact GPS, it would impact our cell phones, lots of things related to our civilization. But you're saying that this even impacts life itself, the crops. How exactly does that play out? How, what's the mechanism by which the damage occurs there? Well, we're talking about uh, more ultraviolet radiation coming in for a brief moment, and uh, that will impact the ozone shield, uh, which could cause crop damage. Okay, and so, so obviously this increased flaring activity is detrimental to life, but you've also mentioned that a lot of these other stars uh, in, in the article that we'll reference in a minute here, a lot of these other stars also have variability in their brightness. Uh, explain how our sun fits into that picture. How calm is our star compared to the other stars that are out there? Well, that was a surprise of this discovery. I mean, they were already, astronomers were already anticipating that our star would be special and having very calm flaring activity. But I think what really surprised them, our star is special in another way in that its luminosity is extremely stable. It was more than five times more stable than we see in the most solar-like stars. I suppose it actually has a factor in explaining, for example, why our climate is as stable as it is. We're not dealing uh, with the solar luminosity variability that we see typical in the most sun-like stars. I think that's a pretty important point that, you know, we're not just looking out at all stars out there. We're looking at stars that have ages and luminosities and rotations that are similar to our sun, yet we're seeing this great increase in variability. That, that really does seem to indicate there's something pretty special about our sun. Yeah, factor of five is not trivial. And so I think it gives us more appreciation about just how blessed we are to have this very stable sun so we can have this advanced civilization here on Earth. Well, very much, thank you very much for your comments, Hugh. I, I really appreciate it. You know, sure. there is this common tendency to think that our solar system and the Earth are just kind of run of the mill or ordinary when we look out in the cosmos. But more and more, we're finding that Earth and the solar system look unique in their capacity to support life. And one way is in how stable our sun is and how much that helps support not just life on Earth, but particularly advanced civilization. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and find Hugh's article about this. It's called, A Dull Star is Necessary for a Great Party. Check it out, you'll get great information that will equip you to go share just how remarkable our solar system is, how it supports life to those you encounter. That does it for us this week on 2819. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that you're ready to read some more Spider-Man comics. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We are at 2819 show and also subscribe to the show. And if you want the audio version, you can get it on most major podcast services. Just search Reasons to Believe podcast. We'll see you next week. Bye.